like to thank you all for coming, and I would like to express my gratitude towards all the activists who put themselves at the mercy of the state in order to create an environment of liberty. What you do is truly valuable to the lives of everyone in this room and to those who feel they do not have a voice. Tonight, we have two speakers who will tell us their stories of civil disobedience and the consequences they had to face in order to protect our national human rights. These two are not the only activists here today who have had to go through this system. For all of you out there, who put your reputations, careers, and lives on the line to express the need for change, I would like to thank you as well. Young Americans for Liberty is an organization dedicated to you and to the students who have the potential to improve and inspire liberty. We support liberty in all forms and look to build bridges in order to achieve a freer lifestyle. In this student group, party lines are invisible. To us, there is only liberty and we will continue to rise up for this cause. Liberty is a constant. In order to preserve and improve the liberty we experience in our lifetimes, we must remain vigilant. I hope the stories you hear tonight will inspire you, and as for the documentary from personal experience, I know it is awesome. Uh, there is popcorn refreshments, uh, popcorn's free, soda, water, a dollar. Um, and after the screening, we'll have a question and answer session. I encourage you all to network with each other, to connect, and further this amazing movement. It's my pleasure now to introduce an activist who has fought tirelessly in the name of liberty. Her story is one of bravery, bravery and devotion. Please welcome Ms. Elizabeth Edwards. Okay, so I'm blushing now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Monica. Um, so I guess I'm here to tell my story of how and why I faced down the state and what happened because of it. Um, in October 2011, there was a little movement starting called uh, Occupy New Hampshire, which was, of course, uh, you know, drawing its inspiration from Occupy Wall Street. <clears throat> and myself and a few other liberty people in the area, I had just moved to Manchester, by the way, like a month previous. <laughs> And uh, myself and some other liberty people wanted to go to these occupied general assemblies and see what they were talking about and hopefully bring some ideas of volunteerism and positive solutions that didn't involve government coercion into the conversation. Um, and I think we did that. And although at first I was hesitant to uh, come out as what is known as a free stater, which I'm pretty sure all of you, is there anybody in the audience does, who doesn't know what that means? Okay, yeah, I thought, I thought so. <laughs> um, I think that people figured it out the night of the arrests when a Busload, literally a busload of people showed up, including and Marv, and out spilled a bunch of keen activists and free staters, and everybody, you know, all these people in the Porcupine community, and they all had their cameras trained on me <laughs> and the cops, obviously, uh, which was important later, as you might imagine. So I think that kind of blew my cover. <laughs> But it was really important to me to have the support of my community. And at the time, I was integrating myself into a new kind of community of people I wasn't sure I would get along with. And although some of the occupiers clashed, um, most m my experience with Occupy New Hampshire was largely a, a very positive one and I made some great friends and um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. So we had a general assembly on a Saturday, mid-October, and that is a 
in Veterans Park here in Ranch, and uh, there was a great turnout, like 400 people. It was fantastic. And there was a march and all that sort of fun stuff. Bank of America, bad for America. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then that night, we moved to Victory Park and occupied it, um, because that's part of the Occupy movement is this idea that we're not going away. We're not going to show up for a couple hours with our signs and then just leave so you can stop, you know, thinking about anything important. You know, okay, well, we're gone, out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so we moved to Victory Park out of courtesy to the Manchester Police Department who had a foot race for the Fallen Sunday morning. And a lot of people kind of got gushy about the relationship between Occupy New Hampshire and the police department early on. And I, I guess it was okay for about three days, um, <laughs> which was, and it, like, like we did leave to have consideration for the MPD and all of that. And we spent a second night in Victory Park. And then Monday moved back into Veterans. And we wanted to be in Veterans Park because it has much better visibility. It's right there on Elm Street. And Veterans Park is very large. We only had a few tents, um, maybe 20 people spending the night at that point. And Wednesday night, the Wednesday evening at the General Assembly, we heard that, well, the police officer, or the police chief didn't, didn't want to do this, but the mayor was putting so much pressure, and, <laughs> and so they had to come and, um, you know, disperse our gathering. Um, and, so there were a lot of choices that I had to make that night. Initially, I didn't want to lose my civil disobedience virginity to occupy New Hampshire. <laughs> 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 um, when I moved here, I knew that CIVDIS was a tool that I was willing to use, that I was willing to get arrested for liberty. Um, but that night, I planned on walking away when the police showed up. I thought, I, I'm gonna save it, you know, for something <laughs> something bigger, something that I have more faith in. But that night, there were a few activists who were occupiers who really inspired me. They were not members of the Liberty community, at least not at the time. One of them was a, an older Filipina immigrant who had dodged machine gun fire or, you know, ducked behind surfaces in the wake of machine gun fire. I don't think you can actually dodge it. Uh, and during the Filipino revolution when the dictatorship was being overthrown in the 80s, she was a hardcore revolutionary. And she came to America because she thought it would be better, that there would be um, freedom here, respect for human rights. And she was sad that it wasn't like she thought it would be. And that's why she came to the Occupy meetings, to try to make things better. And not only was she planning on getting arrested, or rather staying in the park until the police arrested her, which is a little bit different. Nobody wants to get arrested. Um, she even planned on resisting arrest. And luckily, we already had uh, pro bono legal help. And I have to say, side note, pro bono legal help is something that if you can line that up before the arrest, do it. Because <laughs> let me tell you, that has helped a lot. Um, and the lawyer at the time, you know, said that that could get really messy and it'll distract in court later on 
the resisting arrest will distract from the main issue of whether or not this park curfew is legitimate or not. And we were worried about her safety. She wasn't like, you know, some t vital 20-year-old uh, like the rest of us or most of us. And the look in her eyes was one of the things that made it hard to walk away. And I had made another friend there uh, for the five days that we'd been occupying named Matthew Richards, who couldn't be here today because he had a prior commitment. And he's a slam poet and an anarcho-pacifist. And he was 19 or something at the time. And he decided that he wasn't going to leave either. And he and Cecilia, the, the woman from the Philippines, planned on locking arms and when the police arrived. Like I said, they were talked down from that by our lawyer. But when the police showed up at 11, which is when the curfew, the curfew kicked in, um, I walked away. And I walked to my car with my best friend, um, who's now my fiance, sitting in the front row. And I had a dialogue with myself that I did not move to New Hampshire to get pushed around by playground bullies. That's right, yeah. And I knew that I would regret it if I left. And part of my identity, my self-concept, is that I do the hard things that other people don't want to do. And if I left, then I, would, I knew I would struggle with that, that I would have regrets. So I turned around and went back to this police encounter and I was arrested. And the cops, they like to ask, so you want to be arrested? You can, you can leave now. And it's like, no, I don't want to be arrested. Thank you very much. It's not my choice to be arrested. It's your choice to arrest me. Um, and it was a good thing there were so many cameras because when the cameras stopped rolling, the police officer who was putting me in the back of the van, I, I asked him rhetorically, are there dangerous people out there? And he said, yeah, people like you. That astounded me. This idea that because I believed that I had a right to public speech, political speech, which is the most protected speech in the country, because I had the idea that that was a 24-7 right and not a right that I had when it was convenient for those in power, um, that, that made me dangerous. And when the van door is shut, I, being arrested is frightening. I'm not gonna lie. Or at least it was for me because all of the police officers were men. You know, you get handcuffed, you're helpless. Um, it's not a good feeling. And when the door shut, I started crying because I knew that Dave Ridley wouldn't catch it on tape. <laughs> and when we pulled into the garage, which was about a 30 second ride, because Veterans Park is kitty corner from the police department in Manchester, or the police station, um, the, the single cop who had told me that I was one of those dangerous people from whom he needs to protect the populace, uh, said, why are you crying? And I answered honestly, and I said, I'm scared. And he said, you should be. That was, to put it mildly, inappropriate and unprofessional. And 
one of the, and when I went into, and I was kind of astonished that you said that because it's a very threatening thing to say. The, the, the implication there, there are implications of violence that obviously were already all around us with the isolation and the handcuffs and et cetera, but he was making that much more explicit. I did file a complaint, nothing happened. Big surprise. And I lined up with four other people on the bench, and that is when, that was a defining moment in my life, I have to say, um, because I really bonded with those people. And some of them were, were in an argument with another cop about the homeless population, and I was not in the mood to really talk to anybody. Two of those individuals did not make it to the trial for one reason or another. Um, there were, the, in the trial I speak of as the jury trial that was a month ago, um, there were 18 people who received citations, um, you know, citations for violating curfew. And there were five people who were arrested and charged with a Class A misdemeanor. Um, and I was one of those five. And we were before Judge Lyons in June on the Friday of Pork Fest. So I missed the biggest, gayest dance party to sit in court. And I had about two hours of sleep under my belt because it was Pork Fest. That was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> and Judge Lyons, of course, pronounced us guilty, uh, sentenced us to a fine and uh, 90 days suspended sentence for a year of good behavior. We wanted that to happen because if Judge Lyons had not convicted, then we wouldn't have been able to appeal it to a higher court and his ruling would have been meaningless. Um, and so the citations are being appealed still to the Supreme Court of New Hampshire and that should go forward uh, in a couple months. The arrests, we got a jury trial because we were facing the possibility of jail time. And Cecilia didn't wind up in our trial um, and neither did this other kid who just skipped out on Occupy like the night after he was arrested, whatever. Um, I guess he was there for the kicks. <laughs> and, and the trial, I have to, I'm very grateful to the New Hampshire Civil, Liber Civil Liberties Union because they provided our pro bono legal help throughout all of this. And the staff lawyer, Barbara Cashin, um, represented us admirably. And I give no thanks at all to the prosecutor, who was not a very nice woman, and chose to villainize us on the stand, saying that we thought we were special, and we deserved special rights and unique treatment, which was obviously not the case. We were there because we believed everybody had the right to not litter or vandalize or beat on a drum at two in the morning, but exercise political speech and hold our signs and, you know, stay there until people started noticing and until the community and the state and the country and even the world, because Occupy wasn't is a global movement, um, started taking it seriously that the, the world is out of control, that the state is out of control. I didn't think I would be testifying because, on the stand, because I thought I'm not going to be a sympathetic witness. I'm, <laughs> the jurors are going the jurors are not going to want to acquit an anarchist because anarchists are scary. And 
But I did end up testifying, all three of us did, and Beth is in Maine, and that was the other, um, my other co-defendant, so that's why she's not here tonight. And I was so proud of all of us, and Matt Richards, who I mentioned was a slam poet, made the jurors choke up. His, his testimony was so beautiful, and in the end, the jurors convicted us anyway. And luckily, uh, Ian Freeman was able to talk to one of the jurors after it was all over and, you know, paid her, offered her 30 bucks and finally she acquiesced to 10 minutes of questions. And they, our judge, the prosecutor, and of course our defense attorney all talked about jury nullification. So yes, the prosecutor talked about jury nullification. And the juror who was questioned later said, yes, we all understood that we could have given them an, a not guilty verdict. We, we understood that that was a choice. Um, and we convicted anyway because we need rules. That was the argument that went out in the end in that deliberation room. And our defense attorney, Matt and Beth, were all disappointed because they expected more from these Americans. They believed, as my attorney said, very disappointed afterwards. And she's retiring soon. She's not some like young idealist. She said that she was disappointed and that she believed in the jury system. And I felt a little bit bad for her because, yeah, if you believe that an apparatus of the state is going to give you a just outcome, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Buildings will crumble. <coughs> And I'm sad that we only got mediocre people in our jury room, in our jury pool. That might sound a little bit harsh, but um, anybody with a backbone could, and because I know that two people did initially say not guilty, anybody with a backbone could have swung that jury. Um, and they decided they fell to the prosecutor's arguments that we were that we were going to kill the grass. That if uh, if they returned a not guilty verdict, that the city's parks and playgrounds would become camping grounds, and that there would be people staying there 24/7. You know. Of course, if you let this one little violation go, chaos. That is always the argument, that we need every last one of these ordinances and rules to keep at bay the terror of humanity and their dirty, you know, masses. Everybody's going to go wild and crazy and disrespectful if you give an inch on any of these rules. Um, so a fear tactic, obviously, but I can't, I wasn't surprised that it worked. I don't think enough people have woken up yet for juries to start nullifying victimless crimes. And I still have hope that jury nullification can be a path to liberty. It wasn't a month ago in my case, but as at some point we will reach saturation, even that if that's only in the state of New Hampshire, um, where we will have at least one person with a backbone who knows that if you don't hurt anybody, you haven't done anything wrong. If there is no victim, there is no crime. And when we have just one person like that in every jury, then I'd like to say that this won't happen anymore. So maybe I am still hopeful, a little too hopeful, 
in this apparatus, but I have to be hopeful because we don't have very many tools at our disposal, and they have tanks and bombs, and the, the faith of the vast majority of the world's population that we need an authority to keep us safe. They have all of that behind them. So we need to hold on to hope, and we need to hold on to how much better things can be. And I'm, I don't regret what I did for a minute. I'm glad that I was able to stand trial with these wonderful, admirable people who inspired me to not run away and to look at the police officers and say, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. By the way, I was just expecting like a question and answer panel, so <laughs> this was, these were your unprepared, off the cuff remarks by Elizabeth Edwards. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Please enjoy Dark Tape with Woo! 